Hello, and welcome to the Choralosophy Podcast. This is episode 126, Expanding Our Musical Vocabularies with Christopher Tin. Humans aren't capable of completely original ideas. Everything is borrowed. This is an idea that Christopher and I discuss in this episode, and I agree with it. I'm interested to know your thoughts. But this, this week, we meet international star composer Christopher Tin. In the choral world, we met Christopher with his blockbuster Baba Yetu that a lot of us have done with our choirs, school choirs, etc. And it's one that just, of course, everyone loves to sing. He recently completed a project with Voces 8 called Lost Birds and has exciting projects coming up. In this conversation, we discuss the process of creating music for video games versus concert performance, as well as our ideas of cultural identity and the way we blend cultures when music travels around the globe through and through time. Christopher has a very cohesive way of describing this and how it formed his own musical culture. Tune in and expand your vocabulary. Before we get into that conversation, of course, don't forget to use your promo code at sightreadingfactory.com when you get your membership. Every single time you sign up, I want you to throw Coralosophy in that discount code. That helps the show a lot, and it gives you a discount. And you can do the same thing at the other websites that sponsor this show, mymusicfolders.com. You can get a discount when you get all their choir folders. Uh, sheet music at ryanmain.com and graphitepublishing.com. You can throw the, the promo code in there as well. And of course, don't forget to head over to Coralosophy Patreon group, which is patreon.com forward slash Coralosophy, and sign up for $3 a month or more and support financially the costs, the recurring costs of doing the show. It really, really helps a lot. The producers at Patreon are Brannigan Lawrence, Brian Long, Venture Studios, John Warner, Jonah Clixpole, Ulrika Igrain, Munoz Alarcon, Angie Schilling, David Kowalsik, James Mock, Jared Hendricks, Kyle Peterson, Max Jackson, Michael Heron, Nathan Hines, Ryan Main, and Stephen Kathy Kakachik. Okay, everybody, I am here with composer Christopher Tin, who I'm a big fan of, and I'm really excited to pick his brain about all kinds of his ideas about how to create music and why we create music and, and what our music means to us. So, Christopher, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you. Is Christopher the appropriate nomenclature? I, I I do Chris, but what is your preference? Formally, I'm Christopher. My friends all me all call me Chris. A lot of my fans call me Chris. It's all good. Okay, you can well, call me. We'll Chris. Do, that's I'll, fine. I'll, I might, if you're in trouble, I'll, I'll go Christopher. Oh, right, yeah, that's fine. And yeah, <laughs> at least that's how it was for me growing up. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of growing up, I always start with this question with my guests, but I I want to know about where you come from both musically and geographically uh, the, what is your origin story for why you do what you do now uh, i'm from northern california originally from the bay area uh, a small town called palo alto which is kind of on the map because of the tech industry um i uh boy musically i grew up playing piano trumpet and concert band singing in choirs playing guitar in my friend's rock band playing jazz in my other friend's bass uh, sorry playing bass in my other friend's jazz combo you know just doing a lot of different things that young hungry musicians do and all while doing it i was very interested in music theory um and i I think my teachers quickly recognized that I was very adept at musical theory and music theory and understanding how music works, you know, basically just the construction and architecture of it. And that kind of became my calling card as I as I went through college and um, eventually went to grad school and so forth. So, you know, I really found from an early age that I was much better suited as a composer as opposed to a performer. So were your degrees then in music theory or were they in composition? They were in composition, but actually I had a pretty um, fairly sort of diverse liberal arts education. I was actually an English major and a music major, um, which is why there's such a sort of a, a literary bent to a lot of what I do. Uh, I was also an art history minor. So, I mean, I was just kind of into all sorts of modes of creativity and artistic expression all through school. Uh, but music was definitely the cornerstone of what I did and what I was best at. Yeah. So once was it composing for a living that was in your mind right away when you went off to school or was this were you still at an exploratory phase where i just i, I like music theory and i'm going to go do college and see what happens like wh how planned out was your uh, career path i think i knew probably from high school that i knew i wanted to be a composer um but i was keeping my my options open through much of college um 
you know, there are other sort of areas that I'd sort of explored, some on the more sort of quote unquote traditional practical side, um, and some that were also artistic, things like architecture, for example. Um, ultimately, I just kept going back to music because it was what I enjoyed most and what I was best at. Um, and uh, I think it really sealed, I think it, it was really sealed in my mind when um, I applied for two things at the same time, to go to a grad program at the Royal College of Music in London, and also a Fulbright scholarship to pay for it. And I got both. And at that point, you know, it's sort of like the universe tells you, okay, this is it. You know, this is what you're going to do. Yeah. Wow. Wow. That's, that is definitely a, it's like a universe, the universe giving you a gift card and yeah. saying, you know, spend it wisely. Or a roadmap, I, honestly, yeah. it's more like that, right? You're just a kick in the butt. Like go this way. Yeah. Don't go this way. Go this way. Uh-huh. Wow. So what, how many years were you in London then just for school or did you stay there for a while? I just stayed there for school. I mean, I quickly moved to LA because, you know, I'm a California guy, right? I love being in, in the Golden State. Um, and, uh, you know, I spent more than a year in London because it was a 14 month grad course. And so, you know, I stayed as long as I could. I mean, I love London. I go back a lot. What, now, what would you say was your biggest, uh, well, I shouldn't, I don't, I don't want to say biggest. What, what was your first professional uh, universe telling you that things were going to go well in terms of your first big break as a composer. Uh, what would how how would you describe that story? I mean, I think the biggest break that I had as a composer was writing music for Civilization Four, which happened. That opportunity actually came to me not soon after, or not not too far after um, my college graduation. In fact. Five years after I graduated from Stanford, where I did my undergrad, I reconnected with my old Stanford roommate. And he, uh, at the time, he was, we had actually did the Oxford Overseas Studies program together. So we were, we'd both spent some time in England. Um, and he was a history and computer science major, which I always thought was kind of an intriguing combination. I didn't quite know what he was going to do with it until I ran into him at our five year reunion. And he said, I'm now a video game designer and I'm designing the Civilization series of games. And he had just finished co-designing Civilization three. And then he was about to start on Civilization four. And I was actually already a long time Civilization player. So I was already familiar with the franchise and I understood, it made perfect sense to me why a history and computer science major would become a, a designer for Civilization. Um, anyway. A few months later, I get a call from him and he says, uh, I took one of the pieces that you recorded with your acapella group back while you're at Stanford and I stuck it on the opening menu screen of Civilization IV as we were developing the game and everyone really liked it. And we were wondering if we could hire you to, you know, do a new song for our game. Um, and of course, I was very eager to do this. Um, you know, I, I'd been a longtime Civ player, as I mentioned before. And this is my first gig in the game industry, actually. So I really, really wanted to do a good job. Um, and of course, I said yes. And I spent about a month writing an opening piece for the main menu screen of Civilization IV. And, uh, you know, in composer terms, that's actually quite a long amount of time, especially for somebody who works in media, like in film composing, you know, we're expected to write like two minutes of underscore a day, basically, right? So to spend an entire month on a, a three and a half minute song was, was a really, really slow pace, kind of more like the pace that one takes as a concert composer. You know, when you're mm. writing concert music, uh, you're much more, you pay much more attention to the details and, and your standards are much higher in terms of, you know, the construction of things. Um, mm. So I wrote the song um, and it was called Baba Yetu. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe some of your listeners are familiar with it. Um, and... Yeah, my, my kids just did it last year. <laughs> oh, really? Okay, well, there you yeah. go. Yeah, I, I love stories like that. Yeah. Um, and uh, it became kind of a hit in the game world, um, but it actually quickly jumped out of the game world into sort of the the, the choral community um, as a popular standalone piece of choral music 
that people perform, you know, outside of the game altogether, right? So I don't know if your kid's concert had anything to do with video games or it was just a concert where they happened to sing Baba Yetu, but... It was just a concert and they happened to sing Baba Yetu. Actually, the, there's a, a, a short story that goes with it. Actually, we had learned the choral orchestral uh, arrangement, the, the whole thing, so to speak. Um, and we were going to perform it at the Kauffman Center in Kansas City, which is our big, beautiful concert hall here. And that was all set and learned and ready when COVID started, when COVID oh. happened. And so that performance was canceled and never rescheduled. And uh, and many of those kids were un underclassmen at the time, freshmen and sophomores. And when we had the chance to go back to the Kauffman Center last year, they demanded that we pull back Baba Yetu back out and learn it, teach all the younger kids that, you know, and we were going to do it. And so we did it with a choir and orchestra and uh, it was great fun. And they just were super excited to get to redo it uh, and finish that project. I love hearing stories like that. I mean, yeah. you know, like to me, it, it means so much when performers really, really enjoy the piece that they, you know, mm -hmm. they're, they're being handed to sing. I mean, um, yeah. Yeah. And of course, I was also a civilization player. Uh, ah, very good. So, yeah, I, I grew up on that stuff. And so I, I do have some questions about Baba Yetu, because this is what one of the things that I was really interested in talking to you about is um, how is how the demands of writing for a video game that it has a particular theme, like different societies and cultures, you know, building their civilizations. And of course, they probably had artistic requests for you i'm guessing like how does that process work when they're saying hey we want a song do they give you instructions of what they want the song to sound like or is it really just carte blanche and it has become carte blanche for me um i mean i wouldn't say you know 100 percent carte blanche generally mm -hmm. speaking they want a certain sound um and a certain you know feeling emotional sensibility you know we want it to be exciting optimistic get you you know, pumped to play the game, things like that. Um, I don't get a lot of detailed notes about how they want the music to sound anymore. Um, it just tends to be like, can you do something kind of like you did before for that game? You know, it's kind of like that sort of, you know, it's, it's sort of like if you go to somebody for something that they already do, you don't really sort of like, you just kind of let them do their thing, right? And that's kind yeah. of where I find myself a lot these days. Um, not to say that I wouldn't, you know, do different things for other projects. If, you know, people so with them. Baba with Baba Yetu though, since that was the first one, was that different at the time? Were they a little bit pickier or pushier with you? Well, no, I mean, but they had essentially picked a piece of music that I had actually produced with my acapella group. Oh, that was the same piece. Is it, no, it's a different piece. No, no, oh, no. Oh, it's different. But okay. that piece also had a very strong African vibe to it. I see. And other things, um, actually, not orchestra, but African with heavy drums, some you know instruments as well. It yeah. Was, Kind of a whole production as well and it really resonated mm -hmm. with them and so they're sort of like we like how this is working you know with kind of this this african gospel vibe can you do something similar to that i see i see uh, yeah that makes sense that makes sense so um what was there an inspiration for you prior to that experience with like of course the the piece has a swahili text um and that african feel was that a, a musical i guess culture that you were interested in prior or were you dabbling how does that how does that uh what's the inspiration for that i should say sure um so you know as i'd mentioned they they had taken a, a track from a cd that i produced with my acapella group at stanford right and that was an acapella group called talisman acapella um and they they're still around and they specialize actually in uh, world music, quote unquote. So a lot of what they did was either African or from the African diaspora. And so through being the music director of that group, I, I did a lot of arranging of African choral works. I did you know a lot of arranging of, of works from other languages. Um, and so I would already had quite an extensive exposure to non-Western music by then. Mm hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. So when you uh, think of yourself and the career that you've built it, since that time, since we kind of just, uh, I framed it for you uh, as kind of a break, you're know, breaking it onto the scene. If, if you, if you don't agree with that framing, you're, you're welcome to push back. Of course, that was the first time I had heard, uh, heard of you. Um, and, and that was of course, several years ago. Uh, and you do lots of other uh, video, video game music. And of course you've got choral music. If, if someone on the street who maybe is not a musician were to say, Hey, you know, nice to meet you, Christopher, what do you do for a living? Do you uh, just say I'm a composer 
or how do you do you talk about the video game thing? How do you usually answer that question in a coffee shop? I'm a composer. Basically. Do, do you do, do you find that you have to explain that to people or are you in L.A. and so people get it? <laughs> sometimes I do kind of have to explain it. I mean, um, sometimes people say, okay, so you wave a stick around in front of an orchestra or something, and then you have to sort of say, well, that's kind of more of a conductor, but I do that too. Uh huh. So, yeah, there is a little bit of hand holding that you have to do. Um, but that said, um, I mean, generally, if I'm just meeting, well, first of all, generally, I don't meet random people. Like, I have a very sort of like closed circuit that I sort of move around in, and that's kind of it. Got it. Got it. Um, okay. Um, but that said, um, if if people ask me, what do you do? I say, oh, I'm a composer. And then if they give me a funny look, I say things like I write music for, you know, choirs, orchestras. I write music for, you know, scores for films and video games. And usually by that point, they say, oh, OK, if it, I, I play film, I, mean, I play video games. I play I've watched films you know, or something. Right. At that point, you give them enough such they can sort of latch their minds onto what it is that you do. But yeah, there is sometimes a bit of a, you know. Yeah, so by that point, they understand that it's like a, it's a real job. Like you're not just writing notes on a napkin and at, in, at the coffee shop. This is a real job. <laughs> I, no, I think that, um, yeah, there's often, it's so funny. I had this whole conversation with, I had a dinner with some investment banker people <laughs> last night, just, just friends of friends, you know, that sort of thing. Right. Um, and, you know, we were saying how there are certain shorthands that immediately help the person you're talking to understand that you're not just a guy who happens to be scribbling notes on a napkin in a coffee shop, you know, mm -hmm. like, uh, in the past year, a few years ago, I signed to universal as a recording artist, right? So that's kind of like one of these sort of like career shorthands you can drop like, Hey, oh, yeah, I'm on universal. And then people say, Oh, okay, so you're actually like making money as a musician, you're not just like some hobbyist or something like that, you know, or like earlier this year, I signed with Yamaha as a uh, as an artist as well. So, you know, things like that, as un unfortunately, there's sort of the cultural shorthand that sometimes people need to to hear in order to understand what you're about. But right. Why we kind of add these things to our bios. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Now, so uh, because I am um, relatively green in the area of being a composer, because I'm not one and I've never been one. If you let's say you are signing with universal does that mean that when you your music is recorded it has to be released with them is that a what does that mean exactly to you and your what's the relationship look like yeah basically anytime i release music i have to do it through universal um and then they they supply all sorts of marketing support um and uh you know the typical things that a record label does you know distribution manufacturing the cds manufacturing vinyl which is actually not an easy task nowadays because there's a global vinyl shortage, right? So they they managed to get my vinyl manufactured in four months, which is a Herculean feat nowadays because the backlog is more than 12 months now. Um, so, you know, that's that's the relationship with, with Universal. Like they really put everything out for me and help get it out into the world. So does that mean you'd no longer have to do things like take commissions? Oh, no, I still take commissions. I mean, um, I mean, I've got a couple of lined up and I, I, I mean, I enjoy them. I mean, because I would be writing music anyway and might as well do a commission for someone and get paid for right. it. So, right. Yeah. I just wasn't sure if that meant that like universal, like you had like a standing commission by, by knowing that you'd have your, that, that music supported. I know these are stupid questions, but I'm not a composer, so I just don't know how any of it works. No, they're not stupid questions at all, actually. I mean, because honestly, the industry is a little hard to understand unless you really sort of wade into it, you know? Right. But um, in essence, uh, every recording artist has a different deal with their label. And in my case, my label is just really, really supportive about whatever I want to do. I mean, if I say, you know, my next album is going to be like, God, I don't know, like me yodeling for an hour or something like that yeah maybe they complain a little bit about that but for the <laughs> most part if i'm just saying like hey look my next thing's gonna be a cappella choral or my next thing's gonna be you know an opera or my next thing's gonna be solo piano music they're just like okay great awesome let's see what we can do with that you know so it's a great it's a great situation yeah yeah now so what 
uh, speaking of other th- those other projects, what do you have coming up? Or are you allowed to tell us about them? Uh, I know that you've got a Voces 8 thing happening. Yeah, well, there's a concert with Voces 8. And, you know, the album that I just did with them came out, you know, about a month and a half ago. Um, I have a couple other commissions lined up um but i'm not sure i want to reveal what they are yet but they're okay. not oral commissions there's you know other things for other um instrumentalists for other sort of um companies for example um stage works things like that so there's a there's a variety there's actually quite a pipeline uh extending for the next few years um that's just starting to sort of solidify now that's exciting. Can you tell us more about the Voces 8? Since so, so many of my audience are choir nerds, they're big Voces 8 fans. Tell us more about that project, what that was like. Okay, so everyone's a Voces 8 fan by now, right? They yeah. are just stunning, stunning, stunning singers. We did a album together um, called The Lost Birds, and that came out on Decca Classics um, on September 30th. And that was a piece that I wrote specifically for their voices. And um, it's called The Lost Birds because it's an elegy um, for extinct bird species. I call it an extinction elegy. And I took poems from the late 19th century by four poets, Christina Rossetti, um, Emily Dickinson, Sarah Teasdale, and Edna St. Vincent Belay. And all these poems dealt with either birds or their absence or implicitly the absence of humans as well. And I constructed them in a way such that we told a story of how birds gradually go extinct and then um, soon thereafter, our own own extinction is kind of um, next in line. Mm. And, um, you know, we recorded it in London at their Voices 8 Center. Um, And we actually live streamed the recording sessions for my Kickstarter backers. This was a project that was funded by a very large Kickstarter campaign. Um, and, uh, after they recorded the vocals, I actually took their vocal recordings to Abbey Road and I brought in the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra and and the RPO recorded the instrumental sections that I wrote to their vocal performances, um, afterwards, which is actually kind of a challenging thing to do because, you know, of course, singers have rubato and, you know, like the phrasing stretches out at times and things like that. So, um, there was some technical challenges that we had to overcome to record the orchestra after the vocals because as you probably know most of the time you record the instrumentals first and then the singers come and sing on top of that Mm -hmm. but voices was so good and you know their their tuning is so precise that um i felt very confident letting them record their stuff first and then adding the orchestra later on if your school or church are in the market for staging products like risers, shells, podiums, movable platforms, all of the things that you need to set your choir up for success, I would like to strongly urge you to check out StageRight. StageRight's products are sturdy, they're durable, they're easy to use. I have personal experience with the acoustical shells and some of the platforms that they have at StageRight, and I can tell you, compared to some of the more expensive competitors, they are a really great option to fit inside of a tight school budget, but also to give you the durability and usability that you need. So check out StageRight at StageRight.com. Wow. Wow. And and the there's a concert live. You said live concert coming up, but re- album's already out. Did I get that backwards? Yeah, yeah, that's right. The album came out about a month and a half ago. Due to our schedules, the only time we could do a, a actual live concert of the whole thing um, is coming up in February, um, actually at my old alma mater, Stanford. Um, cool. And we'll be doing it there at the Bing Concert Hall. I think February, I want to say 25th, I think. Um, anyway, you can check ChristopherTin.com for it. Okay, detail. yeah, that's that's exciting. So how would you describe the the music itself uh, and, and its inspiration? Or uh, would it be similar to something that you have done in the past that we would recognize? Or is, uh, is did you go a new direction artistically? How would you describe that? It's much more lyrical than a lot of my other pieces. Like a lot of my pieces, particularly the ones that people know, tend to be big rhythmic affairs, like Baba Yeti, for example, Uh rhythmically driven, big explosive orchestrations. Um, My other theme to to a a Civilization game is Sonio de Volare, which came out for Civilization VI. That's, you know, big chorus, you know, very sort of like, um, I don't know, uplifting and, and energetic. This is a much 
more subdued lyrical affair. It's very sort of melancholy. It's very pastoral sounding. The orchestra mm -hmm. is mostly strings with a little bit of uh, percussion and harp. Um, and it's it's a much softer album too. I mean, and also here's another major difference. It's the only one which is sung entirely in English. Everything oh. else that I've is a whole mix of languages, as you probably know. So it's um, it's quite a departure, actually, for a lot of um, from my previous releases. Well, I'm excited to hear it. I've heard little clips, but I haven't had a chance to to actually dig in and listen to it. But I, I'm a fan of yours and a fan of theirs. So obviously, it's a, a match match made in heaven. Um, OK, but question about since you said it's a departure and then you kind of described um, the big rhythmic full sound orchestra choir thing that that you're kind of known for it to, at the risk of asking you to psychoanalyze yourself where does that come from where where do you think in your background that proclivity comes from in your music to be sort of uh what the the bigger the bigger rhythmic many languages you know all of those things that kind of characterize a lot of your video game music uh, is is that uh, where where do you what inspiration do you draw on for that and um, this just happens to be the music that i i always enjoyed i mean i've okay. always fan of you know romantic era composers you know big orchestras big sounds um big concepts um uh yeah i mean i just like a variety of timbre um a variety of dynamic level, you know, just the just everything that writing for an orchestra gives you, you know, the ability to interweave parts and, you know, create layers of of, of counterpoint, for example. I mean, these are all things that I enjoy doing in music. Um, yeah. I'm not the type to write a minimalist, you know, um, repetitive piece of music. Um, I'm more dynamic. I I like things like modulations. You know, I, I like tonality very much so which sets me apart from a lot of mod other modern composers um uh and i just like having music that creates a an emotional uh, connection with a listener i suppose yeah. do you do much nerding out in music in terms of musicology when you're blending the different musical cultures and languages together for a piece some yeah um i mean a lot of times especially if i'm being called on to do something in it you know, that fuses together say a musical tradition that's not um, immediately comfortable to me. Right. There's a lot of research. I mean, I have often taken lessons from people on how to think with this musical grammar, for example, or how to pronounce uh, this language, for example. You know, um, these are all important things when you're working with texts that are not native to you. And so mm -hmm. I, I think it's important to really put in the, the research. Yeah, I totally agree. I know that there is there is a strain of thinking within the music world that is I would call like musical cultural purists, so to speak, where if it's not like authentic to the culture that it comes from, then it's like a, a, a bad thing. Um, I disagree with that, but I'm interested if you've ever come across that uh, that idea and what you think about that. Nobody has ever mentioned that to me, really. I mean, also what I do a lot is I actually go to great lengths to actually work with people from those cultures, you know, right. collaborate. Um, and also, it's sort of like if you're if you're doing it and honoring the culture at the same time and not trying to steal somebody else's musical grammar and pass it off as your own. I mean, that's a different thing than, you know, a, like a pop star stealing, you know, uh, some other musical culture and, and just, you know, like appropriating it, right? That's what we right. want to avoid. Um, I actually, if you were to ask my opinion on this idea of cultural appropriation, I tend to be very um, relaxed about certain things about cultural identity. Like personally speaking, I think music from one culture should be shared and enjoyed and appreciated and, and blended with other cultures. You know, I think that's really great. I look at it like, you know, food, for example, cuisine. Like, I think food, different cuisines um, are wonderful and should be celebrated and fusing them together is, can create delightful new flavor combinations. So why not, why not be open minded and celebratory of all of, you know, what both food and music has to offer around the world? Yeah, no, exactly. And I do want to know your opinion about it. I, I think um, I agree in that with music and cuisine, it's a really good example of an analogy, because if we were to take the purist 
standpoint, which is that let's say I'm not going to do any music from that that even draws upon African, for example, r- rhythmic culture or, or rhythmic traditions or rhythmic practices, if it's not going to be used in that same setting, well, then if we took that same logic and applied it to other areas of life, we've we wouldn't have most of the things that we have in the world because everything is a is a an idea baby for the lack for lack of a better word one idea meets another idea and those two ideas form together to create something new and to me that's a lot in a lot of ways what your music does is it takes ideas from different places and different times even and fuses them together to create something new and and uh, that's probably intentional on on your part but what are your thoughts about that you know it's it's interesting there is a theory of creativity that goes that humans are actually not capable of coming up with an original thought, but are right. only able to graph together two separate thoughts and create something new out of that, right? Yep. So like a unicorn is not an original idea. It's actually just the idea of a horse with a horn. I mean, it's, you know, things like that. And so, I mean, I, I think, yeah, I, I sort of agree with that. I mean, at the at the root level, everyone who's creating something is doing it by tapping into what they know and what they've been exposed to all their lives. And it behooves you if, you, if you follow this logic, to be exposed to as many different things as possible and to be as, as um, open to as many different modes of thought or, th- you know, performance or, or, you know, musical ideas or whatever. And somewhere in all of it, it all gets synthesized and your influences come together and get spit out in what is hopefully your own musical language. But nobody ever did things on their own. We're all a product of everything that we digested up until now. Yeah, no, I agree. Now, earlier you mentioned being relaxed around concepts of identity and and or even just the topic of appropriation. How do you think about your own personal identity? Is there a musical culture that you identify with? Is there, I'll just share mine first as an example. My musical culture is Midwestern evangelical church, acapella, like gospel, because that's what I grew up in. And until I went to a music school to be trained to do music, that was really the only kind of music that I ever knew as a kid. Is, Is there a particular like type of music that you could point to in your upbringing? I think I could rattle off a few examples. I mean, um, so classical music is a big sort of cornerstone of the technique, right? That I, you know, and that, that comes from just, you know, years of schooling, right? And, mm-hmm. and just, you know, being r- r- like taught in with, uh, taught how to do certain things, voice chords in certain ways, right? Counterpoint in certain ways, right? So that's the very sort of intellectual side of things. I also had a jazz background. So I mean, I think I tend to think um, I I tend to to I wouldn't say structure things in the way that jazz writers do it. But um, I tend to be harmonically inclined in organized sorts of ways, the same way that jazz, you know, writers are arrangers or composers. Um, I was a big fan of uh, classic rock growing up, right? So you know, the Beatles, uh, you know, The Who, Led Zeppelin, Grateful Dead, Pink Floyd. I mean, you know, these were all bands that were sort of my jam mm-hmm. back in the 90s. And, you know, they say that when you're the music that you listen to when you're 14, right, sort of imprints itself. Um, and I think, you know, what I got out of listening to a lot of those bands growing up um, is that, you know, they a lot of them created albums, not just songs, but, you know, entire albums that had sort of concepts that pulled them all together. And that's why I sort of like to make quote unquote concept albums when I make my own recordings. I like, I like having a a through line, a story. I like tracks that go from one to another, you know, with a very sort of neat modulation and an attack into the next movement. Um, And, you know, those are just sort of things that I imported from from my early childhood. Musical theater. I like musical theater. Film Mm -hmm. scores love John Williams, right? All of that is part of the vocabulary. Spent a lot of time listening to Copland, Gershwin, you know, American composers who are um, very open to embracing American vernacular music in their compositions. Um, they've all been very inspirational to me. So that's kind of how I look at myself. Yeah, that's amazing. And and I think in a lot of ways, aspirational for 
all musicians to look at it that way. That's kind of how I see it is like, yes, I had uh, a church music background when I was younger and that's where I learned, that's where my music education started. But my goodness, how much richer my life has become since I started doing other things other than that and, and, and branching out and taking oh, this. Well, here's a thing I learned. I learned to love music in church. But then when I went out of my church, I took that information, that knowledge and went into my school and started learning other types of things and then took that into my voice lessons and took that into choirs and musicals and, you know, all of that. And, and I think that ultimately the way I think of musical culture and musical identity is that I'm I'm just a musician. And it, it, there are, of course, I have preferences like anyone else. There are certain types of music that doesn't do much for me and certain types of music that really like lights my fire. But at the same time, it's all just music. Um, and, and it sounds like from this conversation so far that you, you kind of think of yourself that way too. You don't want to be boxed into one particular thing. Is that right? I mean, I think, yeah, that is absolutely right. I mean, over the years, I've sort of learned to be a little more disciplined in my sort of musical wanderings. I mean, there's there's still plenty of times where um, if I'm scoring a game, for example, I'll write, you know, like a, a synth pop song or, you know, lay down a trap beat and play some organ part over it or something, you know, like there'll still be uh, a sort of romp around different musical genres from time to time, just doing owing to the nature of scoring work. But for the most part, I'm trying to be more disciplined in terms of what gets released as a Christopher Tin album. Like, I want there to be a thread that connects things. Um, and I want my catalog to make sense, you know, when it's out there. Mm. Um, so you can't, what I learned quickly is that you can't expect to have a fan following and just whip back and forth between different genres of music, just it, it leaves people disoriented without a real sense of who you are as an artist. So you do have to be a little bit mindful of how you're perceived. Yeah, uh, for sure. And and I wonder, uh, I don't want to put you on the spot with this, but are, since you mentioned being more disciplined, are, are there examples you could share of maybe something you had to cast aside uh, because you of that idea of trying to keep, make your, your um, catalog make sense? Um, well, okay, so here's an example, like, um, boy, in 2012, I actually did a synth pop album called God of Love with a friend of mine. And conceptually, you know, if I describe the concept of uh, to you, which is basically, I, we took a bunch of Renaissance and Romantic era poetry by people like um, John Donne, for example, you know, or Christina Rossetti, another perennial favorite. Um, and we created all these, like, basically like either uh, trip hop or synth pop songs using all of this old poetry as the lyrics. And they were all explorations of love, you know? So conceptually it's like, okay, that kind of makes sense as a Christopher Tin album, right? There's this literary bent to it, you know, there's this recontextualization, but it was such a dramatic departure from my previous album, which was Calling All Dawns, which is the album that Baba Yetu came from. Um, that nobody really knew what to make of it. You know, some of my hardcore fans were like, oh yeah, I still love that album, but it did not do well at all. Um, and I quickly learned at that point that, you know, people are looking for the next album that sounds basically kind of like the album that they used to, you know, that they discovered me with. You mm -hmm. know? And, and that there is something to be said for having a disciplined approach to what you put out into the world. Wow. Yeah, that's interesting. I want to, um, I think I'll probably have us kind of go in one final direction uh, as we're finishing up here, because this has been really fun and really interesting. Um, if you had to name or, or even describe to us one of your pieces in your catalog that I, I kind of, I like this question with composers, uh, <laughs> something that didn't do well in terms of like sheet music sales, like for people that would perform. So this is kind of putting on your hat of that type of composer that, you know, people could buy your music and, and perform it. Um, that didn't do very well, but you really think it should have. Like, hey, if people knew this piece, they would go out and sing it. Is there anything that falls into that category for you? Yeah, there is. Um, actually, uh, I wrote a piece called Woloyo Yamoni which is a 12 minute piece. So I understand it's a bit of an undertaking. Mm -hmm. um, it is a setting of a rainmaking prayer in the East African language, Lango. 
And um, I consider it actually my best piece. I think people who like Baba Yetu would enjoy this piece as well, especially if they're looking for like a bigger, heftier piece that, as a challenge. Um, it's a piece where I, I, I think, you know, I wrote some of my best themes. Um, I, I structured it um, in a way that I, I just still excites me to this day when I hear it, especially the last couple of minutes and how it reaches a huge climax. I just wish it had gotten more attention. And actually, it's gone viral recently um, on Twi on TikTok. Uh, you know, things happen. Uh -huh. Go viral on TikTok. Um, this one went viral amongst the French speakers of TikTok recently, and it's gotten renewed attention, um, which is great. Uh, but it's one where I was I was just disappointed that people didn't think of it as the next Baba Yetu and start performing it. So, yeah, yeah. Now, yeah. I when afterwards, definitely uh, via email, I'll ask you for a link to that, and I'll put it in the show notes just to see if we can get people people listening for it. But I agree, the twelve minute thing for a lot of people might be a barrier if they're um, if they're planning out a concert to the minute and they don't have 12, <laughs> 12 minutes to to spare. But that's interesting. So okay, so then I'm going to follow up with the opposite question: Is there anything in your catalog? that you weren't really expecting to do all that well, but then it kind of took off. Well, Baba Yetu, I guess. Well, no, that's not true. Actually, from the moment I actually played Baba Yetu for some of my friends, I sort of realized I'd written something that was that had legs. Um, but the, the, the extent that it went out into the world was it's still kind of a surprise to me. I mean, I thought I'd written a really good video game theme and a lot of people would like it but the fact that it jumped out of video games um into the choral community and essentially launched a whole second career for me as a you know choral composer and recording artist um that's i'm very blessed that that yeah. happened um, yeah and that doesn't actually often happen for people i mean it's, you know there are plenty of well-known pieces of video game music but they're always tied to the video game that they're written for in some way you know right um, and the fact that there are a lot of people who have never played a game or um, didn't even know it was from a video game, still enjoying Baba Yetu, um, that's been a real treat for me. So, yeah, I should have asked this earlier, but is the, is there a how story for that too? In other words, how did it um, jump out into the performance world? Was there a particular influential choir or sheet music publisher that made that connection, or or was it just organic? How'd that work? I think what really happened was when the sheet music was published by Alfred um, shortly after the game came out. Like Alfred was starting to get into video game music and, um, you know, was looking to release a few titles. And, and this was one of them that they really sort of latched onto. And I mean, they, they did a good job of, of promoting it. Um, but at the same time, I think the idea that a piece of video game music could be performed, you know, in a concert a choir setting was kind of novel and exciting and so and you know i think i like to think that's kind of a fun piece to sing anyway so i think it was a perfect storm of of different factors that that led to its embrace yeah absolutely well christopher on the way out why don't you uh share with everybody again the best ways to find you and find your your sheet music for example if they're choir directors who want to do do some of your stuff where do we go to find your stuff uh, ChristopherTin.com has everything you'll need. It has um, basically every piece that's published by my current publishers, Boozy and Hawks and uh, Hal Leonard as well. Um, and there are all the different arrangements available for my different pieces, you know, for different voicings and ensembles. And, and you can check it out all there. Uh, you can follow me on social media. There are links to all my social sites on my website as well. So go to ChristopherTin.com. Absolutely. And they'll be able to find all that stuff in the show notes too, including I'll make sure that they get plugs about the Votus 8 project because we've got a lot of fans in the audience uh, for that as well. So th again, Christopher, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate having a chance to get to know you better and I'm sure everyone else will too. Uh, thanks for having me. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, as always, for sticking around to the end of the episode. If you're still here, it means that you know the drill, the big things that you can do to help this show survive. And it it does need continuous help from the audience in order to survive. And that is like, share, interact, 
Leave ratings whenever you can in the podcast app on Facebook. And then, of course, join Coralosophy's Patreon subscriber group. That's where you volunteer to chip in a small amount of money each month. And that's patreon.com forward slash Coralosophy. And then last but not least, and probably the biggest thing you can do is, is shop at the vendors that have promo codes. That's sightreadingfactory.com, ryanmain.com, graphitepublishing.com, and mymusicfolders.com. And every time you shop there, enter that Coralosophy checkout. Helps you, helps me. Thanks a lot, everybody. We'll see you next time.